Steve, thank you so much. Best of luck. Hope it goes well. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, thank uh, all the specialists and Snuffy Hotel for inviting me to speak about this very important topic. Um, just to go over the objectives for this session, I'd like to provide an overview of the clinical features of inflammatory back pain, discuss some of the conditions in which inflammatory back pain presents, mainly ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis, uh, discuss the key differentiating features between mechanical and inflammatory back pain, uh, have a discussion about investigations and management strategies. So back pain, why is it important? Up to 60 to 80 percent of the adult population reports having low back pain at some point in their life, and approximately 20 percent of patients with back pain consult their GP each year. And as we're all aware, back pain is one of the leading causes of disability in the UK, resulting in impacts on our economy through loss of work days and it, it's a very important um, socio-economic condition. I uh, know back pain is due to mechanical causes but a proportion can be due to mechanical causes and it's very important to identify these patients and start treatment quickly. So initially, differentiating inflammatory versus clinical back pain, a lot of it can actually be done by, by the history. And I have to say, my colleagues in um, physiotherapy have been um, a great, um, you know, some of the best referrals I get from large back pain are from physiotherapists. Often they're taking a very good history. And the key features for inflammatory back pain are chronic pain, where the duration has been for yeah, the corners. Uh, the age of onset is uh, usually with the rush, and I just want to roll tomorrow. After periods of rest, and not sitting for long periods or first in the morning, they tend to improve with activity and exercise. So, our patients will tell us that if they're going to the gym regularly or exercise, then the symptoms are a lot better. The symptoms are much worse. Inflammatory conditions, early morning symptoms are very important. So, early morning pain and stiffness in the spine or the peripheral joints, more than 30 minutes, um, is a sign for an underlying inflammatory problem. In terms of mechanical back pain, the onset may be acute or variable, it can be chronic if it's been ongoing for some time, it can present at any age. Generally, the symptoms are worse with activity and they improve with rest. So, that's the complete opposite for uh, inflammatory back pain. So it's really important to keep this slide in mind um, when considering whether a patient has an underlying inflammatory back pain. The causes for mechanical back pain, uh, degenerative and herniated discs, passive joint degenerative changes, osteoarthritis, spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and vertebral fractures. So inflammatory back pain uh, broadly is covered by the umbrella term spondylarthritis, and this is a group of clinically hetero heterogeneous inflammatory conditions which can be split into two broad categories, axial spondylarthritis, which affects the sacroiliac joints of the spine, mainly ankylosing spondylitis, and peripheral spondylarthritis, which um, cover conditions such as psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, and enteropathic arthritis. So the, the main disease that we're talking about today is ankylosing spondylitis. That is usually the condition that we associate most with inflammatory back pain. So ankylosing spondylitis is an axial spondylarthritis, which broadly again is split into two categories: radiographic, where there are X-ray changes which we can see um, and pain radiographs, and non-radiographic, non where the symptoms and signs are all there in terms of inflammatory arthritis, but there are no X-ray changes. And, but changes may be visible on magnetic resonance imaging, and often non-radiographic axial spondylarthritis precedes radiographic axial spondylarthritis. And really, we want to get to a stage where none of our patients have radiographic uh, axial spondylarthritis. We want to get them up early and treat them so they don't get to that stage. And as I said, before, both conditions 
have very similar presentations to me. It's really important to think about other causes of back pain. As a rheumatologist, I'm very focused on inflammatory back pain. As a physiotherapist, you may be more concerned with it, or as a spinal surgeon, you may be more concerned with mechanical causes of back pain. But it's really important not to dismiss or not to think about um, other causes. So think about the wide differential. So tumours are very important, and these can be primary spinal tumours, or they may be metastases, infections with TB spinal TB, particularly where I work, there's a high proportion of TB within, within the population due to our demographics. So I always think about spinal TB, TB sacroiliitis, osteomyelitis, discitis, paraspinous and epidural abscesses are very important to think about. Aortic abdominal aneurysms can present with back pain, so it's really important to think about that as well. Renal disease, um, can present with back and flank pain, gastrointestinal conditions such as pancreatitis and other pelvic diseases can also um, present with back pain, other conditions such as Paget's disease, Schurman's disease, and fibromyalgia. Again, these can all present um, with back pain. So, focusing on cases of spondylitis, this is a chronic inflammatory disease that can affect the spine, sacroiliac joints, and often other peripheral joints as well. The prevalence range is from 0.05% to 0.23%. And unlike many other rheumatological conditions, which are predominantly uh, female dominated, ankylosing spondylitis is twice as common in men as women. Uh, and the onset is usually between the ages of 20 to 30, but anyone presenting with inflammatory sound and back pain uh, before the age of 35 always have a low index of suspicion for underlying ankylosing spondylitis. So again, as with uh, a lot of rheumatological conditions, the pathophysiology is not completely understood. Um, it is thought that environmental factors um, are act as a trigger in individuals who have a genetic predisposition uh, to ankylosis spondylitis. The most important uh, genetic risk factor is the presence of HLA B27, and between it's really important to realise that it, between 3 to 8 percent of the general population are positive for HLA B27, but not all of these people will have ankylosis spondylitis, but it increases their risk of having that during their lifetime. And it's really important to remember that 90 percent of people with ankylosis spondylitis are HLA B27 positive, so you can have a subgroup of patients with ankylosis spondylitis who are negative for HLA B27. It's a good test, it can be done in general practice. It can help us screen and uh, ensure that we're referring and seeing the right patients in, in the room charge department. Um, and hypotheses have suggested that the immune system is exposed to microorganisms uh, via barrier damage, even in the skin, um, due to psoriasis or in the bowel, due to inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's and osteocolitis, and this may be of relevance in the pathophysiology. So, um, just to recap which patients we should have a low index suspicion and uh, who should be referred to the rheumatology for further assessment. These are the BSR British Society of Rheumatology referral guidance criteria, which were published towards the end of last year. They're quite help helpful because they cover many of the clinical signs and they're really helpful to our colleagues in primary care to know which patients to refer on. So, as we've discussed before, low back pain that has lasted for more than three months, and particularly four of the following uh, additional criteria are present. So, low back pain that began with the age of 35, so young patients presenting with back pain. Um, waking um, due to pain in the second half of the night is also a key symptom. Alternating buttock pain, and again, as I said before, with the lunch back pain, the improvement of movement. Again, the response to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can also be a big clue, uh, as obviously the family history. So patients who have a first-degree relative with a spondyl arthritis, this may be an axial spondyl arthritis, such as ankylosis spondylitis, or a peripheral spondyl arthritis, such as psoriatic arthritis, epidermatic arthritis, or a reactive arthritis. Again, have a high index of suspicion in those patients. Any history of current or past inflammatory arthritis should be a flag and any history of epicytis. So I have a lot of patients referred to me um, by physiotherapists, upper limb surgeons with tennis elbow, patients with ankle surgeons with Achilles tympathy who presented with epicytis. I remember further questioning how yes, they've got flat back pain, which is very inflammatory in nature, and then we've gone to investigate further. 
again, if carbon bottom half through psoriasis should also increase the wound suspicious by increasing spondylitis. So examination. Um, so the features that we discussed previously, most of those are covered in the history. But in terms of the examination, obviously it's very important to determine the posture. So the classic typhosis that is seen like this spondylitis, we're seeing less and less of because we're diagnosing these patients earlier and starting treatment. However, unfortunately, still what I do see one or two patients every year who come to me with marked typhosis, very restricted range of movement in their spine. And they're the type of patients who either have been consulting um, the GPs for many years and have referred on or never consulted anyone. And by the time they come to us, they have the deformities and most of this are irreversible. The disease is usually burnt out and there isn't much usually we can offer in terms of medication. So we like to see patients early before those changes have occurred. Um, focal tenderness over the spine, particularly the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, the sacroiliac joints. It, again, it's an important feature of uh, anterosis spondylitis uh, as this reduced range of movement in the spine. There's all that's all parts of the spine, the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and uh, the lumbar spine. And again, any evidence of any peripheral inflammatory arthritis, so tender, swollen and peripheral joints, these can be in, in the hands, the feet, the elbows, the knees, any of these should be um, a red flag for anterosis spondylitis. Dactylitis, also where you get typically what I describe as sausage-shaped fingers or toes, um, again, should increase our index of suspicion for spondylar arthropathy. Any history or any signs of red-eye symptoms, painful red eyes, which may be indicative of uveitis or aritis, are important to determine. Have a good look at their skin, because often patients haven't really noticed, but you can sometimes find patients who've had have subtle psoriasis um, but that they've never seen before. So I always say to my medical students, make sure you look uh, in almost obscure places that sometimes patients don't look behind the ears, in front of the lichens, the native cleft, in the scalp. So quite a few patients on direct questioning will say, oh, I've always had quite flaky scalps or I've had a lot of dandruff. And when you actually examine them, they actually have scalp psoriasis, which they may not have known about previously. And cardiovascular and respiratory examination is also very important because patients with ankylosis spondylitis may have an aortitis, regurgitation, on and on auscultation. Um, they may have apical fibrosis, so you may hear some palpitations on auscultation of their chest. And also a full neurological examination to make sure there aren't any underlying mechanical features. It is possible to have two coexisting inflammatory and mechanical problems. I do have patients with ankylosis spondylitis who also have, also have herniated discs. So it's really important to use the examination to help differentiate the two. So investigations, for some of these can be done in, in primary care. Um, uh, X-rays are very helpful, particularly in patients who are slightly older. Often in young patients, we don't see any X-ray changes, which is great because we don't want to see any X-ray changes. But if we do, we can see sclerosis, erosions and fusion at the sacroiliac joints. You can see the classical squaring of the vertebral bodies. We can see Romanus lesions, which appear as, as dense um, corners on the vertebral bodies, syndesmophytes, which, which are due to ossification of the spinal ligaments, resulting in the rigid and loose spine, uh, which we see in textbooks, and also erosion and ankylosis of peripheral joints can be seen in the next resection, mm -hmm. very helpful, uh, but, but not necessarily diagnostic in, in early disease or non axial spinal arthropathies. Blood tests are helpful as well. So a raise at ESR and CRP would point to an underlying inflammatory problem. And often patients with anterosis spondylitis may have raised inflammatory markers, but this isn't this isn't always the case. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, HLV 107 is very helpful because if it's positive, it greatly increases our index of suspicion and um, and also should prompt a referral on to, to a rheumatologist. MRI is really good standard, standard for diagnosis, um, depending on where you work um, and under which uh, commissioning bodies. Um, where I work in the NHS, most GPs um, can't request MRI scans, however, some physiotherapists can. So, approximately, let's say a fifth of my patients come to me with an MRI with a diagnosis, but the others are don't and, and um, we request the MRI in physical care. These are some of the um, features that we can see on imaging. So as you can see on the radiograph of the lumbar spine, you can see the syndesmophytes on the anterior aspects of the vertebral bodies. You can see that the vertebral bodies are very square. So that's a classical square of the vertebral bodies so that you can see in advanced established ankylosing spondylitis. 
and on the MRI images of the sacroiliac joints, you can see the inflammatory tear changes, which importantly are on both sides of the sacroiliac joints, and that's really important um, because that again indicates active sacroiliacis. So it's important to refer to rheumatology for suspected cases of ankylosing spondylitis for a number of reasons. To confirm the diagnosis, if that hasn't already been done, uh, if the patient hasn't had the relevant imaging, so, and so it's very important to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, to review any current treatments, if patients have already been started on treatment in primary care with um, non-steroid, it's important to review those to assess um, any need for escalation of treatment, because nowadays we're very keen to escalate treatment as soon as possible. We really want to start patients on biologic disease modifying drugs as soon as possible, uh, because this really has a huge impact on, on their outcomes. And this can only be done really in secondary care by a rheumatologist. Um, referral to physiotherapy, if they haven't already been referred, we often refer our patients to physiotherapy. Although, um, when I first started in my, in my current NHS role, I did an audit of uh, all of our patients with ankylosis spondylitis. And I went through the notes and I asked the patients if they'd ever been referred to physiotherapy. It was quite a high number, obviously, said or changed it forgotten, but I hadn't referred to physiotherapy. So it's really important that they do see a physiotherapist at some point and continue the exercise. Show. It's also important um, for all rheumatologists to arrange regular osteoporosis assessments and make long term arrangements for follow up and monitoring. So, making a diagnosis isn't enough, but we have to put long term monitoring in place for these patients. So, treatment, as we discussed before, uh, physiotherapy, um, if they haven't already seen a physiotherapist, that once diagnosis has been made, an individualised structured exercise program is, is very important. Um, we also direct them to the, the National um, Ankylosis Spondylitis Society website, where there's a lot of professional and exercise and lifestyle, but uh, seeing a physiotherapist is, is vital in, in my opinion. First line treatment is non-steroid and anti-inflammatory drugs, and we want to start the lowest effective dose um, of, of the non steroidal. So these can vary. So the proxin is often already started in primary care. Um, patients can have ibuprofen um, and also the COX2 inhibitors, such as atroicoxib, is quite good. Um, it's really important to consider gastric protection. So whenever I prescribe a non steroidal, I always prescribe a PPI. It goes with that because these patients are on these drugs for long term. And it's also important to think about risk factors to look at their renal function, their liver function tests um, to see if they have any, have any increased history of gastric ulcers, if they have any suspicions for inflammatory bowel disease. So it's very important to think about risk factors if we're going to put patients on long term non steroidals. Um, now, in terms of the treatment, and say it's the first line, but again, as rheumatologists, we're very keen to escalate the treatment as and when required. And the biologics have really revolutionized the treatment of inflammatory arthritis, model arthritis. Um, and anti TNF medications such as adalimumab are the first line treatment. Um, and they're great medications because they help with the joint symptoms, the axial joints, the peripheral joints, but also some of the extra articular manifestations such as uveitis, psoriasis, and plantar disease. So, anti TNF drugs really are first line uh, treatment for ankylosing spondylitis. If for some reason a patient can't have anti TNF drugs, or they've tried them and they've had side effects or there are other contraindications, then there are other drugs that are, that are available, and those are mainly the IL-17 inhibitors. Um, NICE are currently also in the process of approving uh, a JAK inhibitor as well, which hopefully will add to our arsenal of drugs that we can use to treat ankylosis spondylitis. This, this is great news. When I first started as a rheumatologist six years ago, we didn't really have much choice. We had two anti TNF agents. If they didn't work, we couldn't really progress. But now actually more and more drugs are coming up and actually the outlook is, is quite good for, for treatment options. So follow-up. So each follow-up visit it's very important for rheumatologists to monitor disease activity. But we use this um, using a scoring system called uh, a BAS diet, a BATH, uh, the BATH Ankylosis Bondylitis Disease Activity Index, and you, you get a score. Uh, we do these at baseline and we do them at each visit to make sure patients are responding to treatment or that their uh, disease isn't just progressing. We also assess them um, clinically to, and examine them to see if they're having any postural changes. So I do some measurements when I see my patients so actually able to trace distance. I um, examine them and check their chest expansion just to make sure there's no clinical um, progression on examination. 
we also monitor their response to treatment, be that some patients aren't on any medication, they're take, undertaking their physiotherapy exercises, the disease is fairly well controlled. Um, other patients are on steroidal, so again, we would assess whether they, they continue to respond to those, whether they're having any side effects from, from the non-steroidals. Um, and then obviously biologics, they need care for close monitoring, and we need to make sure that they're not having any adverse events. Infections, reactivation of infections such as tuberculosis is quite um, a worry for us. So we monitor these patients very closely. Um, and also we monitor for extra articular manifestations. So whenever I see a patient with ankylosis spondylitis in my clinic, I always ask them about their skin, their eyes and their bowels, just to make sure they're not developing any extra particular manifestations, which may not have been present at diagnosis. So it's really important to keep a close eye on these and um, identify them as soon as possible and then refer on to the appropriate specialists. Um, also, it's very important to assess and manage uh, modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. So very recently, it's been identified that inflammatory conditions such as inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosis spondylitis, they are all independent risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So it's very important that we treat these conditions adequately to bring down the burden of inflammation, but also that we treat and manage modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. We do this in conjunction with our colleagues in primary care. All our patients, when they come to clinic, have their blood pressure checked. We ask the GP to review other cardiovascular risk factors, such as their lipids, blood glucose, we look at their weight. So it's really important that this area isn't, isn't neglected and it's done very much in partnership with our colleagues in primary care. We also do an osteoporosis risk assessment every two years because these patients are very prone to osteoporosis. So it's really important to ask about previous fractures, family history of hip fractures, whether they smoke, how much alcohol they drink, um, and other potential risk factors, as well as doing bone density scans as appropriate. So complications of ankylosing spondylitis. Osteoporosis, as I've discussed, is a major uh, complication and it's one that we monitor for closely. Uh, spine fractures as a result of osteoporosis in, in these patients, hip involvement with either fractures or ankylosis, um, anterior uveitis again can present at onset or any time during the course of, of the disease. We do actually, I do actually have quite a lot of referrals initially from patients who've presented with uveitis or eye problems and then the ophthalmologist then refer us onto us to see that their underlying associated spondylopathy, particularly if they're HOV27 positive. Apical fibrosis, again, it's something that we sometimes pick up um, on assessment and monitoring. But again, we are often referred patients from the respiratory team who've been found to have apical fibrosis either incidentally on imaging or if they've presented with respiratory problems. Aortitis is, is rare, but again, it's something that we look out for. So we do a cardiovascular examination. If there are any concerns, we need to do further imaging, echoes, etc. Um, and then again, monitoring um, and uh, addressing and identifying the complications of treatment are very important because the drugs that we use aren't without side effects, they're quite potent, so it's very important um, to be aware of potential side effects, mainly infections in, in, our, in our biologics cohort. This was obviously a, a great concern during um, the height of the COVID pandemic, um, so we were very vigilant regarding these patients. They were all um, clinically extremely vulnerable and um, they had extra measures in place such as shielding. Uh, again, the vaccinations, a lot of these patients will have had four and now maybe even five COVID vaccines because of the medication that, that they're on. And the other major complication which um, is very, very important to clinicians to think about is, is the impact on quality of life. So patients can you know, be very impacted with their quality of life both in terms of their physical disabilities but also the the mental health implications as well. So again, if the disease is poorly controlled, it can have a huge impact on, on quality of life. So moving on to psoriatic arthritis, which as we discussed before, comes under the umbrella term of the peripheral spondyloarthritis. Um, and this is an inflammatory arthritis associated with skin psoriasis, but it's important to remember that not all patients with psoriatic arthritis will have skin psoriasis. Um, this is a common misconception. Um, so you can have a psoriatic arthritis without having skin psoriasis. Um, other factors to consider are the family history of a first degree relative with psoriasis, um, other clinical features of psoriasis other than skin features. 
So again, her prevalence is estimated to be anywhere between 0.3% and 1% of the general population. Um, and it varies from the studies that you look at, but some studies have said that the incidence of psoriatic arthritis in patients with psoriasis can be up to 42%. So it's very important that dermatologists, um, GPs, etc., have a very low index of suspicion for an inflammatory arthritis in patients with psoriasis to present with joint pain. I'd have to say probably about a third of my referrals to my spondyloarthropathy clinic of my colleagues in dermatology uh, with patients with, with joint pain. And quite, quite rightly so. I think it's very important, even if they're seen just once, just to exclude one line psoriatic arthritis, I think it's very important. Um, and the other thing that's um, a very important is patients with psoriatic arthritis, 40% of them will also have a spondyloarthritis. So they may present with a peripheral inflammatory arthritis um, and over time can in back pain, etc. And upon imaging, we may pick up the inflammatory uh, changes in the spine and state by reptoids. Again, as opposed to other rheumatological conditions, um, there's equal prevalence in men and women. Conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia, rheumatica, lupus, etc., are more common in females. So the psoriatic arthritis is a split with ankylosis spondylitis, it's more common in men. So these are two anomalies um, that um, differentiate these from, from other rheumatological conditions. So um, the five subtypes or clinical patterns of psoriatic arthritis. Um, so the classic type predominantly affects distal interphalangeal joints um, with typical nail changes. These can be pitting, hyperkeratosis, nonpolysis, um, and often these changes can sometimes be quite subtle. So patients are always very surprised when I start looking at their nails or if I tell them off for a nail varnish. Um, they don't really understand the relevance of it, but nails are very, very important. Um, and and uh, so I do have a close look at both fingernails and toenails. Sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish other causes for nail dystrophy. So particularly in toenails, onycholysis can look very much like a fungal infection. So sometimes that can be difficult clinically to ascertain. So if you can, or if the GP can to get some nail clippings to exclude fungal infections, that can be helpful. These are all really clues. Um, the second subtype, subtype is the polyarticular subtype where patients present, present with uh, a symmetrical inflammatory arthritis affecting the proximal joints, the PIP joints, the MCP joints at the wrist, and clinically looks very much like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but their rheumatoid factor and anti CCP would be negative. And when you look at them, it may look like a, a rheumatoid presentation. And sometimes these patients are diagnosed as seronegative inflammatory arthritis or seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. But it may transpire that they have a family history of psoriasis or ankylosis spondylitis, or they have subtle nail changes, sort of skin changes that haven't been picked up previously. Um, the third subtype is an asymmetrical oligoarthritis affecting large joints, most commonly the knees, the ankles. Um, and again, in these patients, you know, often they're diagnosed as a inflammatory monoarthritis for, for a long time until other, other features uh, emerge, enabling us to diagnose as this psoriatic arthritis. And then the, the fourth subtype, which fits in the mouth talk from today, are those patients who really present with a spondyloarthritis. So patients may present with back pain, stiffness, all the features we've discussed previously. Uh, and then on closer examination, we'll find the pitting the nail changes, maybe some sense of skin changes will discover a relative uh, psoriasis. So, and then those patients will be classified as psoriatic spondyloarthropathy. Um, so that's the fourth type. And the fifth type, which thankfully we don't see very often, is the psoriatic arthritis mutilans, which is very rare and results in severe joint destruction with telescoping of the fingers. And again, we don't see very, very much of this, thankfully. So treatment options uh, for psoriatic arthritis. Again, the common theme, um, physiotherapy is important um, for all of our patients. Um, disease modifying drugs that we use in psoriatic arthritis, methotrexate, we like methotrexate. Um, it's very good for uh, peripheral inflammatory arthritis. It's less like DMAR treatment in rheumatoid arthritis, also in psoriatic arthritis. And the bonus in psoriatic arthritis is that it can treat the skin as well as the peripheral joints. So, so it's a very good drug and often it's first line um, in patients who, who have no contraindications. We wouldn't start with methotrexate in young women of childbearing age who are contemplating a pregnancy or those who didn't have robust contraception uh, in place. Um, Sulfasalazine is a good drug for psoriatic arthritis as well, and but unfortunately it doesn't do anything for the skin.
skin that illustrates the, the peripheral joints. There's some evidence that there may be some axial benefits as well, but the evidence is fairly weak. Um, Cyclosporin, again, can help with the skin and the joints, but as rheumatologists, we don't use very much of it. It's often the dermatologists who are using cyclosporin for the skin. And then biologics. So patients who have been on at least two disease-modifying drugs um, we'll call it, and they're still active in terms of their psoriatic arthritis, they'd be candidates for biologic treatment. And the beauty of biologic treatments in psoriatic arthritis is that it treats axial uh, inflammation, peripheral joints, and also the skin. So again, there are there are drugs of choice, but according to NICE, we have to jump through a few, few hoops before we get them. Um, and again, first line around TNF drugs, particularly um, in terms of rheumatologists, because we have the most experience with these in inflammatory arthritis. If they see a dermatologist and their skin is very active, often they're started on other biologics. Secukinumab so is a favourite of um, dermatologists because it's better for the skin uh, than anti TNFs. But again, we start with anti TNFs because they're better for the joints. Evidence is emerging on, on the newer biologics uh, watching the space, but generally we'd start with anti TNFs, then we'd move on to the IL 17 or the other interleukin inhibitors. And now also we have the option of JAK. Well. So again, as with ankylosing spondylitis, the um, our arsenal of drugs is improving um, rapidly, and, uh, and that's great, great for patients. So a little bit about um, idiopathic uh, spondyloarthritis. So it's uh, it's very important to think about patients um, with joint pain or back pain if they have underlying um, ankle Crohn's disease or osteocolitis. So again, a fair portion of patients referred to our clinics. Um, are referred by gastroenterologists, and um, statistics state that between 5 to 10 percent of patients with inflammatory bowel disease will also have an inflammatory arthritis. This can present in a, in a multitude of ways. It may be a spondylar arthritis in a, a back pain um, with early morning pain and stiffness in the back. Um, they may complain of pain and swelling in, in large joints. Um, again, usually this is in the lower limbs, but any joint can be involved. It may be similar to a rheumatoid arthritis type pattern. There may be erosions that we see on x-rays. So it's, the pattern of the joint involvement can, can vary immensely. And it's very important to think about associated clinical features um, when seeing these patients. So um, if they have either perianal or oral ulcers, that can be indicative of uh, active um, inflammatory bowel disease. If they have fistulas, uh, patients with pyodermic epinosum, patients with epithelium then it's important to think about these extra articular features when assessing these patients. Um, and it's very, the other thing to remember is that um, if a patient's inflammatory bowel disease is active, this also coincides with flares of their inflammatory arthritis. So I always say to patients, if your arthritis, if your arthritis is very active and your underlying inflammatory bowel disease is well controlled, then controlling the inflammatory bowel disease will help with the arthritis as well. So it's really important. So usually patients who have well controlled inflammatory bowel disease, the arthritis is, is usually fairly well controlled as well. So they really go hand in hand and we have to work very closely with our colleagues in gastroenterology to, to manage these patients appropriately. The treatment again, uh, we'd like all our patients to see a uh, physiotherapist. Um, treatment again often is uh, guided by um, the state of their inflammatory bowel disease as well. So we like sulfasalazine um, for the peripheral arthritis and also some some forms of spinal arthritis. Um, the gastroenterologist may use a different form called um, mesalazine, um, and uh, this can help both the colitis and the arthritis. Again, we like biologics, they're very helpful in the treatment of the colitis, the peripheral arthritis and the axial involvement. So again, anti-TNF drugs are usually our drugs of choice. Sometimes patients are already on them for their inflammatory bowel disease, um, but there are also a number of other drugs that are used for uh, Crohn's disease and osteocolitis, which can help with, with the arthritis as well. Um, and so, we, as I said before, we work very closely with our colleagues in um, gastroenterology to choose the, the right drugs for the patients. We also have, even sometimes have patients who are on more than one biologic, because the biologic that they're on for their bowels won't do anything for their joints. Um, so sometimes, oh, I've got one patient who's on two different biologics. That was a bit worrying during the height of the pandemic uh, with the risks that um, you require those in order to um, control both the arthritis and the colitis. 
So, so in summary, um, when considering whether a patient has inflammatory back pain, always I think about the duration. If it's chronic, more than three months, have a low index of suspicion. Age of onset is also very important, so uh, less than 35 years of age, if you think about um, inflammatory biases. Uh, and the key feature is, is the symptoms are worse with rest. This is differentiates from mechanical back pain, which, are usually, which is usually um, improved with rest. Um, improvement with activity and exercise also um, is, is a very important clue. And as with most rheumatological conditions, the early morning symptoms are, are very important. So 30 minutes is around about the ballpark that we use. Um, so we always ask about pain and stiffness in the spine or the peripheral joints that last more than 30 minutes. And again, when assessing these patients with back pain, it's very important to be vigilant for extra articular manifestations. So always think about their eyes, their skin, nails, um, ask them about um, their bowels. And I think the key thing to take away from this is if we identify inflammatory back pain earlier, we can start treatment early and have a, have a huge impact on, on quality of life. These are my references. Thank you. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, OK, so thank you very much to Dr. Tapper there. Um, sorry if you have had any of the sound issues that we've had throughout the uh, CPD education session. We did check the sound and I believe the recording uh, will that we send out to you will have a, a clear sound if there was anything that you need to uh, actually catch up on there. Of course, you can always send us in questions and we can get them posed for you. Um, just whilst we look at the upcoming uh, CPD education events that we have, if you have any questions, please type them into the into the chat function and uh, we will be able to get them posed now and we can look to get some answers for you. So earlier on, I did send out an email to everyone just in case there are any questions that uh, people wanted to ask, before, you know, maybe you couldn't arrive. So there's one question we have here, um, although it may have been covered, if if there is early suspicion of inflammatory back pain in primary care, uh, which bloods are we best requesting? Uh, that was from Alison in primary care. Great, so um, we did cover some of this slightly, but just to go into detail, if you're um, concerned about inflammatory back pain or any inflammatory arthritis, so baseline blood tests such as um, the full blood count out of blood is, is helpful. If the plates are elevated, that could be a sign of inflammation. Inflammatory markers, C CRP and ESR, again, are important, but it's, it's worth remembering they're not always raised in um, inflammatory spondyloarthropathies. But if they are raised, again, it would increase your index of suspicion. Um, for axial problems, so mainly back pain and HIV 27, if you can request it, it would be helpful. Most GPs can request them. Um, and again, if it's positive, that will um, increase the urgency with which we, we see these patients. If there's peripheral involvement, it's always nice to have a rheumatoid factor and an anti-CCP as a baseline. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, another question here from James. What are the clinical signs and symptoms of psoriasis if there is no skin psoriasis present? So predominantly, um, it's really the nails. Um, again, uh, if, if you're not looking hard enough, sometimes you can miss the changes, they can be quite subtle. So, so pitting, unless you look very closely, you, you or the patient may not have noticed it. Um, the hyperkeratosis may have been mis mistaken for, for a fungal infection, so you often have clippings been taken, um, has, has treatment been tried for fungal infections. Um, other subtle signs such as um, longitudinal ridging of the nails, which I didn't mention in my talk, but that's another sign, again, which sometimes can be missed. So, so the nails can be a sign of psoriasis. Um, and also the uh, one of the clinical signs, the um, history. So if they have a first degree relative with a history of psoriasis, that would increase your index of suspicion for a psoriatic arthritis in the patient who's presenting with inflammatory um, joint pain or back pain. Um, OK, thank you. There was uh, another question here, and I think it was all sort of answered by somebody else as well. But um, uh, Dr. Tapper, within your NHS work, do you have a specific pathway for patients with axial or spondylar arthritis? So yes, so um, at uh, West Middlesex Hospital, um, I have a weekly dedicated uh, spondylar arthritis um, clinic. Um, all the referrals are triaged uh, by us and we aim to see them uh, rapidly um, and we do have a pathway in place in terms of um, 
uh, investigations and initiation management. We're currently in the process of having um, some guidelines substitute for the GPs uh, in our area for the investigation. That would be nice if they're done before we see them so that we can accelerate um, investigation and treatment. Um, so with the diagnostic delays in getting the diagnosis, what do you think can help uh, speed this up? So I think um, the key is it is in the referral. Um, so when we're referred patients, if, if there's a good history, so if it covers some of the features that we've discussed, if there are the red flags are there, if there's the symptoms are there for more than three months, if they have early morning symptoms lasting more than 30 minutes, if the symptoms are worse on um, the rest and improved the activity, all of those will um, increase the urgency with which we see these patients. So most hospitals have early inflammatory arthritis pathways. Um, and dedicated clinics to try and see these patients quickly. So I think the key is really with the detail in the referral. And if they've had blood tests or baseline investigations, that's helpful too, such as x-rays. If they show changes, we'll see those patients very quickly. Um, if they can possibly HDB 27, then we'll prioritise them as well. Uh, uh, the other thing to mention is we're actually not seeing um, or uh, trying not to see non-inflammatory back pain. So if the history comes across as it's, it's a mechanical back pain, from these referrals will get bounced. And um, so it's really important to have a very good history and examination of possible and the investigations that we've discussed. Another, another question here. Apologies if I've not quite explained this, but so referred pain to the back from uh, GI tract or pelvic disease. How would we differentiate from uh, primary back cause? So, yes, yeah, so that can be difficult. Um, and um, I think. As long as we you know, think about the uh, the principal features of inflammatory back pain that we've discussed, so um, often with um, GI tract and pelvic disease, the symptoms wouldn't necessarily be, be worse first thing in the morning. Um, the um, they wouldn't be improved with exercise, um, and they wouldn't be worse after rest. So I think if we think about those um, initial key clinical features, it should help differentiate what is inflammatory and what is not inflammatory. Um, but in terms of other mechanical features of back pain, I agree it can be very difficult. Um, in primary care also it's very difficult. I mean, in secondary care I have the luxury of, of lots of investigations. I can request an MRI the drop of the house and have my answer. Um, so I, I agree it's difficult, but that was the purpose of this presentation is just to try and highlight the key, key features that should make us think that this is an inflammatory problem. Um, thank you. Uh, would you pick an MRI scan or an X-ray as a first imaging choice if you suspect inflammatory back pain? So personally, I'd give for MRI um, because it's the most sensitive um, modality. You can pick up very early inflammation, and um, I think it's you know it gives us the answer very quickly. Um, but just bearing in mind. Um, MRI isn't accessible to, to everyone in primary care, um, particularly if the symptoms are long term, they've been going on for years, and getting an x ray may give you the diagnosis, you may not have to do uh, an MRI, but most patients still should get one to have an MRI. So, x rays are helpful, but not in early disease, not in very young patients. Um, so, ideally, um, an MRI should, should be. Um, or requested. Um, X-rays are helpful in differentiating between radiographic and non-radiographic. So initially, several years ago, in order to get funding for anti-TNF drug, you had to show that there were radiographic features, you had to have X-ray features. This is this has gone now, thankfully. Um, but again, I think, I mean, if it had a choice between X-ray and MRI, I'd go for MRI, but X-rays still do have a place. Uh, and then one last question here, would you consider a bladder or urinary tract infection? Again, this is probably from referred. Oh, possibly yes. So, um, uh, patients with urinary tract infections um, can have um, uh, present with back pain, particularly flank pain if they have pyelonephritis. Um, so, yeah, often we do see patients that I do acute general medicine. So, I see lots of patients with back pain, flank pain, that can be due to due to a pyelonephritis um, or venous stones, etc. So, yes, so you should think about them. But often in my clinic, all, all our patients have they they are in deficits as part of their screening when they first come into clinic. Um, the history is often often different. And if they had a urinary tract infection, you do expect some systemic symptoms. Symptoms as well, such as fevers, rivals, um, nausea, and hopefully it wouldn't be going for three months. Um, so, uh, again, we don't see very much of this in, in the clinic, thankfully, but obviously during the acute take, etc., we do, we do see these um, uh, presentations of back pain. Uh, okay, one, one last question has come through. Considering any delay before a patient is seen by you, what uh, I think 
think that's good. So what anti-inflammatories should we start with? Yeah, so anti-inflammatories, yes, by all means, please do start anti-inflammatories if you're suspecting underlying um, inflammatory um, back pain. It's, they're very important. They'll help relieve the patient's symptoms. Um, so the proxim um, is, is, is usually a good first line anti-inflammatory to start. I start with the lowest possible dose and then titrate the dose up. Again, as I said before, please um, uh, do give the PPI uh, and consider potential risk factors. So some asthmatics can't take long steroidals. Patients with inflammatory bowel disease, it, it, NSAIDs can sometimes exacerbate their bowel symptoms um, if they have any, any underlying renal issues, if they've got any renal impairment, I, I, I would really start um, regular NSAIDs. Um, second line, usually um, a toricoxib. We quite like that. It's very good for um, inflammatory arthritis and stuff for arthritis. But yeah, starting any of those, some patients are just fine for it and they do well on that as well. So we don't have any issues with starting the, the anti-inflammatories. And sometimes what I do advise is once they've seen me, if they're having some imaging, particularly if they're young or if it's early, I often ask them to just admit the anti-inflammatories a few days before they have their MRI. So I say three to five days before, if you can manage, try not to take it just so that we don't mask anything. Um, but yes, please do start um, non steroidals unless there's contraindication. Okay, well, that was uh, certainly a lot of questions being fired at you there. So it's good to see that there was engagement with it. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time this evening, Dr. Tucker. Uh, the session has been recorded, so we will get that link sent out to everybody that has attended this evening. Uh, that will be an unlisted YouTube link, so you'll be able to follow that and share with your colleagues if they also have interest. Um, the, either the end of this week or the early part of next week, you will also get your CPD certificates uh, sent out to you all as well for your attendance and sharing your time with us this evening. So that is everything from us here at Manfred Health, and I would like to thank you all for presenting and sharing your time with us to come and watch along, and we shall see you for our next event. Have a good evening.